It is a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank the Africa Center for inviting me to join you in the Senior Leaders Seminar. We've had, I think, a rather inspiring beginning of the seminar. We're all right now? Thank you very much. In that We've talked about leadership and strategic planning, but we began by talking about resilience, about the need for economies to develop resilience so that when the world's shocks arrive at your door, whether those shocks be in the form of a violent threat or a violent storm, you have the ability to respond quickly to that challenge or menace and then to continue on the path of economic development, economic growth, and providing well-being for the population. So today, the presentation will look at the strategic framework that we have discussed for managing security sector resources, but we'll also look at the economic environment that African countries are facing, and finally go to some practical examples of procurement and practical examples of how do you monitor and evaluate what you've done. Because the perspective that we have of managing resources is that you manage the resources to support your national security strategy to bring peace and well-being to the population in your country. You're not going to manage uh, to show success by the number of aircraft carriers you've bought or the number of fighter jets that uh, are now in your Air Force, but rather our people living in peace. So the economic environment that African countries are facing is volatile. Uh, and in the case of those countries that produce commodities, the prices are going up and down, but more recently have been staying down. Uh, and although our previous speakers uh, Dr. Matt Wainipo and others have convinced us that Africa is not poor. I think that most of us will say frankly that Africa does face resource constraints. It, uh, the African countries are facing financial constraints. Uh, perhaps at the end of this we'll come to some ideas of how to loosen those constraints and get more money flowing into Africa. But right now, we find that we need to make better use of the money that exists. And as the American proverb says, necessity is the mother of invention. By our necessity to make better use of the funds we have, we will be able to <coughs> invent solutions to the problems that we're facing. Uh, and then we'll go on with some practical examples. One recent topic that has emerged as being very important at every level, but particularly at the strategic level, is the need for a fundamental reform and realignment of the priorities for the use of resources to support the security sector. And the one subject that has emerged as being very important and long neglected is that of human resource management, personnel management. Many of us have come to realize that having colleagues who can solve problems will be the key to success in the security sector. 
and that involves developing programs of education and training and being sure that those programs of training match the equipment that exists and that the capabilities will develop to manage the equipment that will be purchased in the future. More importantly, that the human resources will be able to, the human beings will be able to help us analyze what equipment is needed, what infrastructure is needed. And this depends on developing top-notch skills and expertise, knowledge of the problems that face the security sector, and a knowledge of some of their solutions. So. Now, we spoke about building resilience and institutional strength. Uh, what is critical is not so much how many departments there are or exactly what they will be doing, but whether the department structure, the entire institution is built on core values. And we spoke of leadership values, but these values should go through all of the structure in the way that the structure is established, in the way regulations are established, all of them should reflect the core values uh, that we've discussed in some of our sessions of courage and honesty, competence, and other core values. And it's these core values and principles that shape sound practice. I don't like the idea of best practice. I can't decide what is best practice for Burkina Faso based on what's done in Mali. In fact, what we can decide is what is sound practice. What way of doing things, budgeting or procurement, follows principles that guide good practice, principles that help protect against inefficiency, fraud, and other kinds of mismanagement. I think that General Agwe made clear that integrity is a core value that guides all of your action. And so that even if your boss would tell you to buy that set of trucks, and you know it's because his cousin has that car dealership, you know that you are following your core value of integrity and you would have the courage to say, no, this doesn't follow our regulations, our procurement procedure is this. And so having those core values gives you a guide for the way that you will structure all of the activities in the area that you're responsible for. And so we now come to the challenge of linking resource management with the national security strategies. Uh, we spoke this morning of vision, of objectives and goals. That national security strategy articulates those goals built on from the process of planning and the consensus of the people in your country. But in order to achieve those goals, you must define an approach. You must define ways of doing uh, the business of resource management. And so our topic today looks at the ways of utilizing scarce resources, following those principles, and using the means uh, to attain those specific goals. So we want to achieve the best possible security within a socially acceptable level 
of allocated resources and avoid creating or deepening gaps. And as Dr. Cole said, we are now very aware that bad management of security sector resources can become a source of insecurity. And so if you don't have the right equipment in the hands of the right security forces, you are then vulnerable to attack, to threat, and to contributing to the insecurity of your own country. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Johnson. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the scope of um, resources available. Because before we talk about you know, how you manage your resources strategically, I think it's important to know what resources exist, correct? So um, in the African context, if I were to ask you, what are the sources of resourcing Africa's security sector? Where, does the, where do the resources come from? Where do the financial resources come from? What are some of the examples that you might um, suggest? Anyone? The government gets money uh, or resources through um, taxes. Taxes, that's one. Anybody else? Apart from taxes, anywhere else we get money for the security sector? Natural resources such as oil, uh, diamonds. Natural resources. Yes, true bilateral partners. Sorry, there are a number of uh, sources, both domestic, i.e. taxation, natural resources, and external. It could be assistance from bilateral partners, it could be loans from bilateral partners, it could be engagements with commercial companies. Our countries do all of these things to resource the um, security sector. Um, so how do we start understanding what exists to do this? This is imp it's important because it is part of your strategic planning horizon. Uh, because you know a little bit about the ends. You know a bit about the ways, but the means, we usually come up short. And that's what a number of people refer to as the strategic gap. So let's take a look at um, domestic sources of, um, of um, domestic, domestic, domestic sources. This chart shows um, economic growth rates in Africa. And over the last few years, we noticed that um, a number of um, African countries, most African countries, have been doing pretty well in terms of economic growth. That means we should have a lot more taxation, right? Is that correct? Um. <laughs> if the economy is doing well, it means we should have more sure. revenue to them. Yeah. But the reality is that in most African countries, the amount of taxes that are collected as a proportion of the amount of taxes that could be collected, times it's around 10 to 15 percent domestically. So where we say we have resources, we have oil, etc., our ability to derive the taxes that are necessary or that accrue from that natural wealth is lacking. So while you might see economic growth rates, productivity increasing, um, you don't always see revenue increasing um, by this, at, this, at the same magnitude. 
there's another um, side to this, that the amount of money, financial resources, that leaves the African continent every year because of something called illicit financial flows is staggering. That's the only way to describe it. Total aid that Africa receives every year, if you add the amount of aid that the entire African continent receives every year, it's under 40 billion US dollar equivalent. However, the amount of money that leaves the country because of corruption in various forms, it's more than two times that amount, which means that if there is only half the amount of corruption today that exists, Africa does not need aid. So if we start addressing the leakages, the amounts leaving the continent, we are in a better place to start looking at how we could marshal domestic sources more effectively. The other thing that we want to point out that doesn't usually get a lot of um, attention is debt, domestic debt and external debt. When African countries want to spend money, whether it is within uh, an international program or on their own, if they don't have the money, or if they're too lazy or reluctant to collect the taxes, they borrow. They borrow domestically and they borrow externally. If you look at the fiscal profile of most African cont countries, the amount of debt is weighing not just the economy down, but is making it difficult for, strate for the strategic balance that we require to make national security strategies effective in our countries, it's much more difficult. And so the management of these resources, you start by understanding the sources of these resources. Where are they coming from? And then once you understand the sources, then you can be a little bit more strategic in how you focus on what to do with the resources. To discuss a little bit about what to do with the resources, let me turn back to my colleague, um, Dr. Johnson, to continue. And so if we look at this map of Africa from The Economist magazine, we see that for 11 years, until 2014, there was a relatively rapid increase in African military expenditures. Now, I looked at that map, and I must admit that when I also looked at the report from the Ibrahim Foundation uh, that looked back over 10 years in Africa, uh, based on interviews and surveys with Africans in countries all over the continent, I was surprised that the Ibrahim Foundation said that despite economic growth and better health, that Africans in general, two thirds of the people on the continent of Africa felt less secure today than they did 10 years ago. Even though their well-being, they had more money to spend, or many of the countries seem to have more money to spend, and even though many of the countries, and if you look at the map, um, red is the key color, the largest increases in military spending were by Chad and Ghana that were spending more than two, well, uh, twice as much in 2013 as they had been 10 years earlier. Um, a large group of countries are in the, the red color, not the dark red. They spent between 100 and 200% more 
than uh, they did 10 years early. So those countries include Algeria, Libya, and Angola. Uh, the question for you, and I'm sure all of you are looking at the map and looking for your own country, is what happened to the military expenditures in your country? And do you think that they were put to good use? Does your country feel more secure today than it did in 2004? If you look at the next slide, you'll see that just a few weeks ago, the uh, Stockholm Institute uh, released information on military expenditures and for the first time, we see that African military expenditures declined slightly to $38 billion in 2016. Now, that was the second year of a decline, but that was after the 11 years of increase that you saw in the previous slide. But even though there's been a decline for two years, you have military expenditures that are 48% higher than they were just 10 years ago. So we have seen that African countries are spending a lot more on military, on equipment, and obviously on personnel also. Um, now, this year, uh, the, the past year, there were a few countries that continued to have increases, but at a much slower rate than before. And those include, um, in, in North Africa, includes Nigeria that had a 2% increase in expenditures. But Sub-Saharan Africa had a decrease in expenditures of 3.6%, and that was led by a 54% decline in expenditures in South Sudan. Now, again, when you see that type of decline in a country that is actually in conflict, you have to ask, are the expenditures matching the needs of the country? We see that there was also a decline in Angola of 10% and that other countries that have been plagued by conflict, although they had slight increases in the DRC and in Mali, the increases were much below the increases that there were before. Why is it that countries that need to have better military equipment and better military, more professional personnel are not able to spend at the time of need. Why is it that a country such as the DRC that had some increases in, huge increases in the past, has not been able to get to a situation where the past expenditures have yielded a situation of peace. So we have to ask two things, I think. How is the money being spent? And also, are countries doing anything in their budgeting to allow them to put money aside when commodity prices are high so that they have the resources to spend if they find that they are confronting challenges, security challenges. Um, and I am pleased to see that there are a few countries on the continent, some of whom are represented in this room, that have put aside funds to either invest in future so that they are not just dependent on commodities, but they invest in other types of businesses and activities, or they have funds that allow them to draw funds from 
the funds simply because commodity prices go down. So those countries were putting aside funds when the oil was at $100 a barrel, and now they're able to draw it. So that's given them some resilience. So the questions that we are facing now will be, how do you maintain regular flows into your budget, even if the world is having uh, great volatility in the prices of your natural resources? And also, how do you use those funds better? so that you are able to support your national security strategy and meet any of the threats that might come to your door. Yeah, so um, in summary, I think what we're saying is we have this situation where we need to better understand not just how much we have to spend, but what we spend it on. Um, if you look at uh, most African countries, between 2000 and 2012, there was a gradual increase in the amount of money being spent. But what did we spend most of the money on? If you look at the fiscal profile of most African countries, over 80% of of the um, budget for the military goes on wages and salaries, paying the soldiers. Very little on training, very little on equipment. And so you ask yourself the question, how are we then going to utilize those resources to meet our strategic objectives? Because if all you have are people on your payroll, you don't have people who are equipped, you don't have people who are being trained, you don't have people who you are investing research and development in, then how are we going to attain those goals? So my proposition in summary is that it doesn't matter so it's, it matters how much is being spent, but it is equally important to pay attention to what it is being spent on, because that's what gives you an idea. Um, bad spending and leakages have an impact on security on the security sector. First, it makes your security sector less prepared for current and emerging challenges. Second, it, makes your, it puts your security sector in opposition to other parts of the uh, public sector, because then the competition becomes like a zero-sum game. Thirdly, in some cases, it leads to the crowding out of other important expenditure. And all of these things have nothing to do with structural adjustment per se. But it has everything to do with financial, public financial management decisions that are being made within African countries. Those decisions should be anchored in a national process. In this case, a national security strategy process but quite often it is not. They are being made in isolation or they are being made ad hoc. So we really need to seriously ask ourselves the question. Even if we look at this um, chart, we are able to claw back most of the illicit and illegal outflows from the continent, do we have a framework, a strategic framework that will convert those resources into action that would further your national security goals. We're going to um, wrap up now. Um, Dr. Johnson will talk a little bit about budgeting and budgeting principles. I will talk a little bit about um, procurement in the security sector and then we could have a, a more broader conversation. Thank you. And 
We are here at a strategic seminar. And that's what sets this seminar apart from all the others. And so when we look at this chart that is taken from uh, a paper by uh, three Harvard School of Government economists, we see that development transformations, that is changing the way that you are running the country, uh, changing the life of the people in the country, uh, the kind of changes that come as a result of strategic thinking and strategic planning. Those development transformations are not just economic transformations. Now you might think because we're here talking about resource management that we would be focusing on that diagonal that leads from the economy to administration. But in fact, when we talk about tr development transformations, we're also talking about politics. And we're also talking about society. Much of the talk in this country recently has been about the effectiveness of the police forces. And whereas the debate started in terms of the kind of equipment that was being used, the debate, debate continued as it developed to focus on issues of how do the police relate to the community? What are the structures that are provided for oversight of the police? What role do the police play in society? So what might have started out as a discussion that was looking at uh, administration and management and economic issues very soon became a discussion that included politics and the economy. And the leadership at the local level decided that you can't have better, more effective police without having a better engagement with all in the society, in civil society. So what that means then is uh, that when the police, military, or anyone in the security sector, when they are operating, when they are adding to their equipment, and they are having a process of budgeting that should follow a set of guidelines that you'll see in the piece that is by Nicole Ball and Len LaRue that discusses the guiding principles of resource management. Now, these are the uh, resource management principles for all public financial management. And you'll find a definition of all those uh, items in the paper that you have. But most of the, the discussions we've had have focused on transparency and accountability. Uh, what we talk about information, that everyone who needs the information sees what they need, gets what they need, when they need it, and can understand it. That's transparency and accountability, that uh, those who are making the decisions are held accountable for those decisions, and they had all the information they needed to make those decisions. But today we want to look at this issue of contestability. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that contestability is one of the principles that links the national security strategy with the resource management, because Contestability means that all sectors start off at a level playing field. And we discussed this in our group this morning. So that when they're doing the national security strategy, 
you start off with each one of the sectors analyzing the threats faced in their area and bringing it forward as a group. And then on a national level, there is prioritization, which of the threats are the ones that we must deal with immediately, an understanding of what the priorities are, understanding of what the appropriate forces are, and understanding of what programs and equipment are needed for them to meet their objectives. But that has to be done within an overall vision, and it has to be done with each one competing against the other. Not because one particular force has more prestige than another, or because one particular force is supported by a political party or a president versus another. Equal footing, analyze, and make the choices based on that. And these choices will result in the actual purchase of equipment and the importance, sub, the importance is that all of those purchases must follow these guidelines of resource management. So that when you have a, 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 a rule about procurement must be done in a certain way, that has implications for efficiency if you're competing, you must compete. Let's say you're told you have, must have three competing sources. You're thinking of efficiency. You're thinking of, of doing things in an open way that would prevent corruption or the misuse of funds. And you also must be thinking from the very beginning of how they will be, the funds will be spent and how you will evaluate whether or not they were spent to meet the right objective. And it's to you now. And there's a lot more that we could discuss and unpack. But what about procurement? Um, procurement in the security sector is fraught with a lot of difficulty. And part of the difficulty is because these are sensitive things that are being procured. These are all, and there's a lot of um, classified discussions that um, surround um, procurement. Um, but be that as it may, let me just talk about four challenges I see in um, Africa's um, security sector when it comes to procurement. The first is the problem of the um, competitive strategy. Because in most um, cases, the items being procured, particularly the um, big contracts, are what um, you know, people call low frequency, high value contracts, meaning that you would probably have just one multi-billion dollar contract and that would set your company up for the next five, 10 years. So the amount of competition and also the likelihood of grand corruption increases because of the nature of such contracting in an environment where you have minimal oversight and even less accountability. There's a second um, problem that you see around that some literature calls the ostrich effect. You know how the ostrich buries its head in the sand? In many cases, we see um, not just companies, but officials, you know, having to um, subscribe to the ostrich effect because they do this in many ways, some above, some try to make it above board by disguising bribes as fees. In other cases, it is you no know, just collusion and um, looking the other way while um, grand corruption happens. A third challenge is the revolving door syndrome. We see this not just in Africa, but um, in many places where people retire or people have contacts and so um, uh, once they are out of uniform and in a suit, they still have a lot of leverage. And so they could go around regulations. It becomes easier for them to do, um, participate in misinvoicing and uh, etc. 
Third is um, large post-contract requirements. And add to that you know, something called offsets. Because in a lot of con contracting, there is a concept of offsets where you have other goods or services that are associated with the contract, but are not written on the contract, from which um, the um, signatories could derive a lot of um, benefits. All of these things exist. And we're mentioning them not just to point a finger at what is going wrong, but to highlight the importance of oversight mechanisms, of being clear about accountability structures, and also putting in a framework that is transparent. Because this not only reduces the amount of corruption and reduces malfeasance, but also makes your procurement processes a lot more effective and ensures that you have the goods and services that you require to be successful in your national security strategy. The discussion about you know, how you ad address um, budgeting, how you address procurement, what sort of standards you need to take. I think one thing that um, um, Dr. Johnson mentioned was that you know, we're not here to tell you that we have a best practice for Nigeria or a best practice for Gabon. We're saying, understand what the key principles are. But nothing is like written in stone. Periodically, you have to reassess. And there's a really interesting, um, um, there are really interesting articles in a book that talks about this um, concept of um, problem-driven iterative ad adaptation, which, which um, basically means as you go along, you have to be assessing, and then you revisit your assumptions and make sure that you're on course. Because particularly in the resource management sector, where generally there is a scarcity of um, available resources on the African continent, we have to be more judicious in the way we manage, allocate, and utilize those resources. Because at the end of the day, it is all about how we ensure that we are being successful in delivering security to each and every citizen in our countries.